webinar. Uh, again, by introduction, my name is Chris Blake. I'm a partner in Nelson Mullen's office in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's webinar, which is the fourth in our firm's series of webinars on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, other uh, webinars and presentations that we have had uh, in the past are available on our firm's coronavirus resources page, which is available on the Nelson Mullins homepage. Uh, today's presenters will be myself, who will be talking about business interruption insurance coverage issues, Wes Adams from our Columbia office, who will be talking about OSHA issues, and Bernie Hawkins from our Columbia office, who will be talking about environmental issues. Um, with regard to questions today that might come up, if you will email those questions to Amanda Miller at nelsonmullins.com at the email address that you see on the screen, um, we will follow up with answers to those questions following the webinar. The format we're using today just doesn't allow for um, is not conducive to allowing for live questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please email Amanda and one of us will follow up with you following the presentation. Um, the next webinar that we have, the fifth in our series, is scheduled for April 15th uh, and will address FSLA and ADA considerations for remote workers as well as cybersecurity risks with a remote workforce. Um, today's PowerPoint and recording will be emailed to participants who have registered for the webinar today and posted online. So if we could now go to the next screen, please. Um, again, I'm going to address today the topic of best practices for investigating and assessing potential insurance coverage for business interruption losses. Next slide, please. So we're all aware of the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the global and U.S. economies. Um, and it's on such a scale that it affects all businesses across all industry sectors. In the face of these challenges, we're well aware that companies will be looking for ways to recover or minimize their business losses and may be considering whether their business interruption insurance coverage might be applicable to these losses. Um, we have a working group uh, within our insurance practice group that has been following these issues and we are prepared to offer some practical considerations for assessing whether that potential insurance coverage might be available for issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So the first step in the question of whether business interruption insurance may be available is very dependent on the specific policy language of the policies that you may or may not have. And it is also dependent very specifically on the laws of each state. So the first step that we would recommend is that you inventory all of your insurance policies that you might think could be applicable to a claim for business interruption losses. If you think you have that claim, you should talk to your risk manager and or your insurance agent to make sure that you gather all appropriate insurance policies and endorsements uh, so that they can be reviewed to determine what coverage and what potential claims you may have. Um, if anything you think is missing, you should contact your insurance broker to obtain complete copies. Next slide, please. Um, it is very important if you believe you have a claim, uh, either working through your agent or your insurance broker or directly with a contact that you have at your insurer, you should provide notice of a claim for the loss of business income. If you don't provide notice of a claim, then your chances of being successful on an insurance claim will be severely diminished. Once you inventory your coverage, uh, and if you and your counsel and or broker believe there's any chance at recovery, you should err on the side of providing notice. Timely notice is typically required by all insurance policies, and late notice of a claim is a potential basis for denial by an insurance company. What we are seeing recently with these uh, coronavirus issues um, is that there are both legislatively in a number of states efforts to ensure 
that insurance companies provide coverage for these business interruption losses, whether those legislative efforts will lead to uh, coverage being uh, provided by insurance companies remains to be seen. And so it's important if you think you have a claim, provide notice to your insurance company. And even if something isn't covered, there could be developments legislatively under which coverage may be made available. There have also been lawsuits filed challenging uh, denials already of business interruption claims. And there could be developments in the future through these court cases that shed light or change the interpretation of the uh, coverages that are available that may have an impact on a claim uh, that has already been presented. Next slide, please. So for business interruption insurance coverage, uh, most all risk hazard and property insurance policies typically require a connection between a physical loss or damage to insured property and the loss of income uh, that is seeking to be that you're seeking to have reimbursed. So the classic example of this is a fire at a manufacturing facility that shuts down the facility uh, and then you make a claim for the interruption to your business caused by the fire. In this situation with a virus, if you believe your business has suffered some actual physical damage from contamination, you should take action immediately to document that damage as soon as possible. So for example, if you have a facility or a business where you have employees who have tested positive for COVID-19, you should contact some qualified environmental testing lab or other vendor to record and document the presence of the virus if possible on surfaces of equipment and do that prior to having those surfaces and equipment uh, cleaned and sanitized. In some states, um, the interpretation of the physical loss or damage provision in an insurance policy like this says alteration of the policy or of the property through some contamination is a physical loss to the property. Other states require an actual physical damage to the property and that contamination isn't sufficient. So depending on where you are located, the, the laws in your state may allow for uh, the physical damage requirement to be satisfied by contamination, in this case, contamination by the virus, but you need to document that to be able to establish that. Next slide, please. Uh, the next step uh, in this process would be to document any financial losses, any loss of business income that arises from the physical damage to the property. Uh, if you think you have such a claim, take all steps to ensure sufficient records are maintained to document the loss of income and to demonstrate that that loss is related to the contamination of the property. In these situations, the policyholder bears the burden of demonstrating the losses and it's best to document that as much as you can rather than trying to have to speculate about it or guess about it down the road. Um, in addition, sometimes the cost to remediate the property can be recovered. So if you have costs to remediate your property, to restore it, to disinfect it, to clean up after an exposure to the coronavirus, you should document all of those costs and expenses as well. Next slide. Next slide, there we go. The time period, uh, the period of restoration is the time period for which business income losses can be recovered. And under most policies, it's likely to be fairly limited. There may be an initial waiting period, for example, 60 days, um, in, but then the time period for which losses can recover will typically end once reasonable efforts can be taken to restore the property. This amount of time can vary greatly depending on the circumstances. How extensive was the property damage? Uh, was the property difficult to reach? Is there a lack of availability of qualified personnel to perform restoration efforts? Again, the restoration efforts need to be undertaken pretty quickly because there may be a very limited period of restoration that's covered by the policy. So be aware of what that period of restoration is under your policies and take appropriate steps uh, accordingly. Next slide, please. 
virus exclusions. Uh, this is going to be a significant issue with respect to business interruption coverage uh, related to the coronavirus. Following earlier epidemics and pandemics, uh, including the H1N1 and SARS viruses 15 or so years ago, many insurers added exclusions to their business interruption coverage that excluded losses that arose or were due to viruses or bacteria. Um, these were exclusions that have been uh, allowed by insurance regulators in most states, and many commercial property policies include some virus exclusion. This uh, is going to be a critical component of any business interruption claim arising out of the coronavirus, so there will need to be a detailed review of any applicable policy or any policy you think might be applicable to determine whether such an exclusion was included and what the scope of that exclusion was. Uh, there are some examples of an exclusion that they exclude either a virus or a bacteria, but not both. Um, and depending on the language of the exclusion, those exclusions will typically be uh, construed and enforced pretty strictly. So it's very important to find out first whether such an exclusion is in your policy and second, the scope of it by looking at the specific language that was used in the policy. Next slide. Uh, contingent business interruption coverage. Some policies also provide coverage for contingent business interruption when your business is interrupted by physical damage or loss somewhere in the supply chain at one of your customers or one of your vendors. If you suspect that there has been this type of contingent business interruption to your business, you should advise them, your customers or your vendors, to document any physical loss or damage in the same way as if it was suffered by your business so that you can make a claim for contingent business interruption coverage under your policies. Next slide. Next slide, Alice. Civil authority coverage. Some insurance policies include business interruption coverage provisions that cover losses from what are called civil authority orders. Um, in order for these provisions typically to apply to the coronavirus, there needs to be a civil authority order that specifically orders the shutting down of a business related to specific property damage where again, where this typically comes up is if you have, you know, say a hotel or other business that is damaged by a hurricane and the civil authority, local civil authorities come in and condemn the property and say, you have to shut it down. That's a, that's a, a civil authority order that's related to physical damage to the property. In this instance with coronavirus, what we are seeing throughout the country are states and local authorities issuing general shutdown orders that are intended to stem the spread of the virus and not related to any specific actual physical damage to any property. So in these situations, if you have a business that's been shut down by an order that's an effort to stem the spread of the virus, it may be difficult to get coverage under a civil authority coverage in your policy. Next slide. additional coverages that might not be linked to physical damages. Um, there are a number of specialty coverages uh, that are issued by insurers that expand coverage for non-physical types of damages. Some of these include coverage for cancellations specifically related to epidemics and pandemics, crisis management coverage, coverage for interruption by communicable diseases, and event cancellation coverage. If you have a business that is, or that has purchased some of these specialty coverages um, and, in a, and purchased these in addition to general property damage coverage, you should again examine these policies carefully because issues related to the coronavirus could be implicated or covered by those special coverage provisions. I think that's my last slide, but Alice, if you could advance. It is, and I will now turn it over to Wes Adams to talk about the OSHA considerations.
Thank you, Chris. Hey, it's Weston Adams from the Columbia office. and happy to be with you all today to give you 10 minutes on the OSHA considerations during the pandemic. Alice, go ahead and move it to the next slide, please. So there's a helpful OSHA website. They've got a, a separate page within the OSHA website that basically dopes out both guidance for COVID-19 issues and just general information. There is not an OSHA-specific standard for COVID-19, as you might imagine. They just had not been time to deal with that. But they've got guide, uh, one overarching guidance document and a series of enforcement guidance documents, and they just have some general information. But that, that website reference there is a, is a beginning point. You can go find all this information. And Alice, next slide, please. Okay, so this primary guidance document, this is the overarching guidance document, addresses a bunch of things, and, and they're all doped out right here. Uh, you know, I won't read through every single one of these, but just to point out some critical components here, certainly the infectious disease preparedness and response plan. If you don't have one of those, you need to make one of those. Uh, the guidance calls for implementing certain infection procedures and implementing safe work practices figuring out a way to identify and isolate sick people where appropriate, um, effectively communicating with employees about COVID-19 and work-related issues, uh, implementing engineering and administrative con controls, and I'll get into a little bit of that in more detail in a minute, and then applicability of personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, in certain situations. But Alice, next slide, please. Okay, here's an interesting component of this primary guidance document that was listed on the prior page. It takes basically, it's got four risk categories for employees, and it sort of dopes out the, around COVID-19, what, what would you consider very high risk, what would be high risk, what would be medium risk, and what would be low risk. Probably the most interesting one of these, and with some surprise, really, is the medium risk one. But I'll, I'll get to that in a second. The, the very high risk is, not surprisingly, medical professionals, healthcare workers who are performing in a, any sort of aerosol generating procedures on a known patient, somebody they know has COVID-19. That's the very highest risk. And as we obviously know, that, that has produced a lot of sick healthcare professionals, people being in that situation. So that's going to require respirators, PPE, engineering controls. The second category is high risk jobs. That would be healthcare workers exposed to known or suspected COVID 19 patients, but who are not performing aerosol generating procedures. It's got pri primarily the same protections built in for employees that the very high risk category does. They're, they're similar. But here's the interesting piece is this third category is the medium risk jobs. And the medium risk jobs, it's, it's defined as workers having frequent or close contact, meaning within six feet, with those who might be infected but are who are not known or suspected to be infected. So that's basically people working with the general public. Think of a grocery store worker. That's probably the best example. And so the guidance is interesting in that it's not a hammer or a mandate. If you look at the second, the double I numerate, it quotes the exact language as what these sort of medium risk employees are supposed to do. And it basically says, look, workers with medium exposure may need to wear some combination of gloves, a gown, face mask, and or face shield or goggles. It doesn't mandate it. It leaves it sort of a little bit to the discretion of the employer. But obviously the safer course here for any Anybody who's got a lot of employees in what is called a high population density setting is you, you ought to protect your employees, right? And so the, to err on the side of safety here would be the smart thing to do. And so the definition of who are these medium risk jobs, well, it's just anybody in a high population density. That, that might be the, the definition explicitly mentions schools, but obviously that's out because nobody's in school at the moment. But it, and then it specifically references high volume retail settings. And I think you would think of grocery store workers would be the best example of that. So, you know, it, it basically suggests that we should use PPE and um, the same for plastic sneeze guards, but it doesn't mandate that like a hammer. But again, probably the wisest course there is to 
uh, basically, um, effectively, we recommend that employees employers use these things. That that would be to their advantage, even if it's not mandated here. Uh, then finally, the lower risk exposure jobs. That's like like a lawyer sitting on the phone, like me, who's really not seeing much of the public right now. Um, Alice, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is this is from the OSHA COVID-19 page, and it dopes out the standards. Again, since there's not a COVID-19 standard in place, it dopes out the standards that are the existing standards that are would be applicable to a COVID-19 situation. And that's so for if you need details on any of those, that's the PPE standard, uh, the respiratory protection standard, and then the general duty clause is something that the state state um, departments of labor and the federal OSHA will fall back on if they need something to hang their hat on. That general duty clause is basically saying employers provide a workplace that is free from recognized hazards of any sort, basically. So, you know, that you will probably see that general duty clause cited if you see some sort of citation situation related to COVID-19. Next slide, please, Alex. Now, this is probably the most interesting legal question in the COVID-19 OSHA world, is what do we do on record recording and reporting? And there's a lot of uncertainty about this that is not as of yesterday or, and as of this morning. There was no new guidance uh, from, uh, from OSHA on what to do about this. But you'll remember that you've got an OSHA 300 log where you need to record certain recordable illnesses if you are an employer, right? And for COVID-19, the criteria are three. The list of there is A, B, and C. The case is a confirmed case of COVID-19. Most critically, the case is work-related. And then thirdly, the case involves one or more of the general recording criteria set forth in the regulation, medical treatment beyond first aid, that sort of thing. Well, the, the, conf the confusion for employers here is what is and what is not work-related, right? And the problem, of course, is this disease is now, or this virus is now so widespread among the population, there's really no way for an employer to, in most cases, to know whether or not their employee got this from a work setting. Now, employers generally are supposed to make a determination of whether it is more likely than not that the work events or exposure were a cause. Well, there, that's just going to be extremely difficult in a case of COVID-19 because of the widespread nature of the virus. So, and the same problem also is hanging out there is to reporting. You remember, look at the second to last bullet point on this slide explains that the reporting applies if you have a work-related employee death or if you have a work-related inpatient hospitalization. Well, again, the question is, what is work-related? I mean, is, are these COVID-19 cases of employees, are they work-related or not, if we don't know where the person picked up the virus? So in reaction to all that uncertainty about whether to record on your OSHA 300 log or whether to report to OSHA if somebody dies or goes to the hospital, a number of manufacturers have submitted to OSHA in writing and basically written and said, look, let's have a presumption that COVID-19 deaths are not work-related. And to my knowledge, OSHA has not yet responded to that request. I think that presumption would have to be a rebuttable presumption that then you, the other side could come back and say, well, in fact, we can rebut that presumption with additional evidence. But OSHA has not yet bitten on that, as far as I know. But that, that's really probably so. If that presumption gets put in place, that would clarify both the recording issue and it would also clarify the reporting issue and make it a lot easier on employers and give them a more sort of practical path forward here. Right now, they really don't have a practical path forward. And I think if somebody has a situation where they've got an employee hospitalized or who dies from COVID 19, and you're not sure whether to record it and report it, just you need to talk to your lawyer is the bottom line. Um, next slide, please, Alice. All right, and this is interesting. The There are three different sets. In addition to that primary guidance that I pointed out at the outset, there are three different sets of enforcement guidance. 
that I, I'll just put in the links here. The first one allows, and this all, all this relates to the shortage of respirators. The first guidance allows for the use of both respirators and expired respirators that were certified in certain foreign countries. In other words, they don't have to be American certified. The second one allows the extended use and reuse of respirators and the use of expired respirators, the second guidance document in certain situations. And then the third one basically relaxes annual fit testing requirements for N95 respirators. So that's sort of the enforcement guidance that's out there. So if you look at that and you look at the general guidance document that I explained at the outset, and then look at the information provided on the, uh, the OSHA homepage for COVID-19 issues, you've kind of got the universal stuff that OSHA has out there. Next slide, please. Okay, and, and that's all for my presentation. And next up is Bernie Hawkins from our Columbia office who will be talking about environmental compliance issues. Bernie? Thank you, Weston. Uh, good afternoon and, and pleased to be with you to, to go over some of the environmental challenges that, um, that are being addressed during COVID-19. Uh, next slide. So we, we, we start with the proposition that industries, companies that are subject to environmental requirements are struggling just the same way you just heard our, our other speakers talk about addressing business interruption, the same types of business interruption and interference are affecting the ability to comply with environmental requirements. I mean, you can imagine with stay in place orders, we've got employees, that are still increasingly absent or have been ordered to stay home. Uh, we've got questions about whether employees are essential. Uh, we've got questions about whether consultants and labs can come to facilities to carry out the responsibilities that they would normally help a company comply with. So just a, a, a plethora of questions about whether or not um, and how companies are gonna be able to address non-compliances that result during this pandemic. So EPA on March 26 issued a temporary policy, and they stress this is a temporary policy during uh, the period of COVID-19 that addressed the implications for how EPA intends to look at enforcement and compliance assurance during the pandemic. Now, one thing I wanna stress about this policy and there's been a lot of discussion of this in the press, is this is not an automatic exemption. So it's not EPA saying all the following things will be exempt from enforcement. It's going to be a post hoc analysis that occurs after the pandemic is over and after you've chosen to either rely upon the enforcement policy or not. So I think that's one thing to start with is that the, the categories we're gonna talk about are things that you may miss during, <clears throat> during the pandemic. And, and there's just, there's no guarantee that EPA is going to say, we're not enforcing on this. It's just, we're giving you a policy that helps you evaluate what you need to do to preserve a potential defense to enforcement action. And the types of things that are addressed in the policy, um, you, you can see the list here. Routine compliance with monitoring and reporting, settlement agreement and consent decree reporting obligation and milestones. Now we'll note that there's, an, a, there's a significant difference between a settlement agreement or a consent decree. If you've got a settlement agreement that's just between you and the EPA, um, then the discretion is a lot broader. If it's a consent decree or a judicially approved document with third parties, like citizens or you know any, anything that's been approved by the court, then EPA points out that this policy really doesn't tell you much because the court would have to agree with whatever EPA proposes and third parties could like let's say you've got one with a, well, a citizens group or an environmental group, they would have an opportunity to weigh in. The next category is the failure of emission control 
or wastewater or waste treatment system or other facility equipment that may result in exceedances of enforceable limitations. Um, now, again, an important point to note on this is that EPA has not excused these exceedances just carte blanche. They've said, if you have one of these exceedances, there are certain things you need to do. We'll cover those in the next page. But there are certain things you need to do, including reporting this to the state or whoever your agency is that covers your facility. And we might give you relief from exceeding those limits. Uh, the next category is hazardous waste accumulation in excess of specified amounts or time limitations. So if you're a very small quantity generator or small quantity generator and you can't get somebody to come collect your waste um, and you accumulate more than those thresholds, that might be excused by EPA. Um, again, we'll talk about the fact that states may choose to pursue a different approach. So in that example, if you were gonna rely upon this policy to, to avoid becoming, say, a small quantity generator becoming a large quantity generator, you would wanna to talk to your state to make sure they were gonna follow the same pathway if your state is the delegated state that has the hazardous waste program. The next category is uh, disruptions at animal feeding operations. So this would be for example, removal of a certain number of animals to avoid you becoming a concentrated um, a CAFO facility, an animal facility operation, or to go from, say, if you are a CAFO, being a, a small category to a large category. Uh, and then if the policy doesn't specifically address a particular issue, it, it doesn't mean EPA won't address that issue. Um, there's an opportunity for, for addressing additional situations uh, going forward. Next slide. Yeah, Alice, can you, oh, there we go. It's a little bit of a delay, so bear with us. Um, so with, with respect to this temporary policy, there, there are some critical things that any facility would need to do to make sure you've preserved the grounds to use it when EPA ultimately gets around after the um, pandemic to, to, to looking at particular non-compliances that occur. And, and these are critical, and I'm just going to get through the list uh, with some emphasis on some of these. Uh, but the first is to make certain that you're, you're, you're taking every effort you can to comply with the environmental compliance obligations. And, and I will tell you that as we go into this crisis, as we continue into the crisis, the indication from state agencies and EPA seems to be that the level of surprise, the level of um, reaction so to speak, is going to increase in terms of the standard as we go into the crisis. And what I mean by that is that if, if we're now three weeks into this or since March 13th in EPA's view, um, if you're still operating, if you're an essential business and you couldn't comply with something in week one or week two, they're going to expect that you develop a way to comply with it in week three and week four and week five. So the standard for being able to say this is actually being caused by COVID-19 is going to be higher in week seven, perhaps, than in week one. Uh, so preparing contingency plans, comparing uh, risk evaluations, um, even as we go through this is going to be important to show that you're doing everything you can to minimize the level of environmental compliance of, of non-compliance that occurs during the period. And that's kind of consistent with this next bullet where it says act reasonably under the circumstances in order to minimize the effects and the duration of any non-compliance. Uh, identify the specific nature and the dates of the non-compliance. So all these are things that you're going to need to document very carefully. Um, you can see in the next bullet, um, this one's really, really kind of critical is this, this 
proof that the non-compliance was really a result of COVID-19. So this is kind of what we would legally call a but-for test. And to say that but-for the occurrence of COVID-19, you wouldn't have had the non-compliance. So you can imagine if, if this was something that related to a maintenance issue, for instance, that um, EPA might view as something you should have been doing prior to the to the occurrence of COVID-19, um, that might be more difficult to make kind of that, that causational demonstration that it was actually COVID-19 that resulted in a, a particular equipment failure. And again, looking at um, the very last bullet related to all these bullets, um, you're gonna need to document that very carefully to say what proof contemporaneously document how you meet all of these elements, including you know when you return to compliance and whether that was um, returning to compliance as soon as possible. So if you're, if you're gonna use any of these discretionary policies, state or federal, you need to make sure you're looking at the exact elements that you need to document and that you're documenting those very carefully um, because sooner or later, probably somebody's gonna come back to you and say, okay, we wanna go over, but we want you to write us a letter telling us all this information. Next slide. So let's, let's be clear again, and this has come out in a couple of EPA documents in the last couple of days, um, the letter and then a website where EPA was responding to criticism about this policy. Um, EPA has emphasized that the temporary policy does not provide a license to pollute. Uh, another thing they've said, which is a little confusing, is that it does not alter any provision of any statute or regulation that contains legally binding requirements. And, and it is itself not a regulation. So imagine again, you go back to a number of requirements that are in a regulation that say, you shall do the following. Like, for instance, even the example I gave on the, the accumulation of waste. Um, let's say you accumulate your large quantity generator and you accumulate waste for more than 90 days. EPA says, okay, well, we would excuse that under our discretion or we might excuse that and, and avoid you becoming a TSD. If it's not a new reg and it's not a new statute, can EPA really do that? That becomes a real question. Do they have the authority to do what they're doing um, in a situation like that? And whereas EPA might not pursue you for any enforcement issue, there's always a possibility that a third party or a state, if they had a different view from EPA, could pursue you for a violation in that instance. Uh, so the, the temporary policy does not apply to a number of specific things does not apply to criminal violations, does not apply to activities carried out under Superfund and RECRA Corrective Action Enforcement Instruments. EPA has promised um, additional guidance to discuss obligations that are covered under those type of instruments. Does not apply to imports into the um, United States and EPA has emphasized as recently as the second of uh, this month that they, they have a real concern about things that are imported into the U.S. or even produced in the U.S. where there's a claim like a pesticide or, a, or something where somebody's claiming that a particular substance has the effect of killing bacteria or viruses. And they've been very clear that that's going to be one of their high priorities in terms of reviewing things that are occurring during this time period and taking enforcement in situations where people are um, maybe bringing in things that should have been sub subject to FIFRA or TSCA requirements um, and they did not comply with those things. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it does not relieve any entity from the responsibility under federal law to prevent or respond to or report accidental releases of pollutants, oil, hazardous substances, hazardous chemicals, hazardous waste, 
or any other pollutant. So if you have those releases, you need to report them as would be required under your permits, applicable regulations or statutes, and you need to respond to them as you would um, under normal circumstances. Next slide. <clears throat> so let's talk about a little bit, and what I mentioned it earlier, but some of the things that if you're going to consider using one of these policies, state or federal, um, what do you need to, to, to be particularly focused on? Um, if you're looking at the EPA policy, keep in mind that states and tribal agencies that may have direct jurisdiction over a particular program in a state may take a different approach. And, and we've now seen that there are at least 20 states, probably more as of today, that have issued their own policies. And a number of these policies um, are different than the EPA. Some of them um, have emphasized that they're going to basically uh, stay the normal course for enforcement. Um, and provide little, if any, discretion. Um, others have provided even more discretion than what EPA has provided in terms of maybe extending dates for submissions of certain documents like emission inventories or um, DMR reports under wastewater. So the first thing you would need to do is check and read not only the EPA policy and be familiar with it, but also look to see if your state has a different approach. Um, and you would want to check both of those. Uh, same thing if you're under the discretion of a tribal agency. Um, the, the next thing is that in addition to the discretion allowed under the state or federal policy, COVID-19 policy, don't forget that there are other potential statutory, regulatory, and other types of, of exemptions or defenses that may apply to a non-compliance. Um, so if you have a non-compliance and it would be subject to a voluntary disclosure under a state policy or under the EPA policy, those can still be used. If you have an upset event or an emergency condition that would, that would qualify for um, an exemption under your Clean Air Act permit or your waste permit, don't forget those and don't forget to make sure that you report anything that's required to be report, reported in the appropriate time period, if at all possible, um, include the documentation and the follow-up documentation that would uh, be required by those defenses and make sure you're sending that information to the people that are required under those independent defenses because you don't wanna waive those defenses which may not be discretionary. They may be established and they may be, you know, if, if, as long as I do this, I get the defense. Um, you wouldn't want to abandon those things and, and potentially waive a defense that was available. Be aware too that there are statutory or regulatory requirements that, that sometimes can't be exceeded, they can't be extended by discretion. So let's say you've got a, a permit application that needs to be submitted under the Clean Air Act to renew your Title V permit and the, the, the due date is six months prior to the expiration of the permit. If you fail to submit that application on time, even if the state says, hey, it's okay, we'll give you another 30 days, there's, there's certainly an argument that a third party could make that that is a statutory obligation. And if you don't submit it, you lose your permit shield. And so the, the ability to continue operating may be impacted by um, not submitting it in a in a timely manner. So you want to you want to evaluate the consequences of potential use of these discretionary policies in light of the individual requirements. Uh, the last bullet here is obviously, as I mentioned earlier, third party groups, environmental groups, citizens groups may seek to pursue enforcement even if EPA or a state is granting the discretion. And and there's been um, no secret that the environmental groups have not been pleased with EPA's um, COVID-19 temporary policy, and they've they've made some of those accusations about this being a just complete waiver, and that this should be 
upfront case by case determinations instead of allowing any discretion um, after the fact. Next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> the EPA policy does indicate some heightened concern for certain things. And so, for instance, um, there are heightened expectations for public water systems. EPA's memo says we expect public water systems to continue complying with the rules because you're, you're supplying clean water, which is necessary to combat COVID-19 during the pandemic. So they, they, they put this obligation on um, public water systems. They, they also say in the memo that we expect states to allocate resources to things like public water systems so that they can meet requirements. So there, there's, a, there's a corresponding, if you're, you happen to be a public water system, let's say you can't get something that you need, uh, there's a corresponding obligation on states to provide assistance to such essential services so that they can meet requirements. Um, there's also an emphasis that EPA expects, in, expects entities to operate safely and in a manner that protects the public and the environment. So in situations that, that could create from a release or any other circumstance where you could, could have a situation posing what EPA considers to be an acute risk, or an imminent threat to human health or the environment, there are special requirements that are mandated in the EPA memo, one, one of which is coordination with the state and EPA on how to address mitigating those particular circumstances. And EPA has said, this is one of the things where we are going to focus our resources is in situations where there's been an imminent risk or acute risk that's presented by a situation, that's where we're going to try to allocate EPA resources to helping facilities address how to minimize that impact and to come into compliance as, as quickly as possible. Now, I mentioned that up until this point, the EPA memo talks about making post-pandemic decisions on whether to actually grant enforcement discretion. So they give you these criteria that you have to preserve things to be able to make this argument, but they're actually not ruling upon your argument until after the fact. There's one exception that's provided in the memo that says if you are an essential critical care infrastructure, an um, example would be a water treatment system or um, a power supplier would be another example. EPA will consider, will consider making no further action. So these are advanced determinations that a particular noncompliance is okay before it happens or while it's happening. Um, and these, these limited circumstances will be decided on a case by case basis by the OECA assistant administrator. So a very senior person making this decision with some degree of uniformity because they're just, they're supposedly all going through um, the, assist, the, the OECA assistant administrator. And to make this showing or to, to ask for one of these, you've got to have an essential facility which is employing essential critical infrastructure workers as determined by guidance issued by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And there is some guidance. Um, on the, the homepage for the, the EPA and um, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which includes some guidance on the types of things that EPA will consider or would consider to be essential facilities. So if you, if you had one of those and you just felt like, look, it's too risky for us to operate or continue to operate without getting an assurance up front, um, that EPA is going to agree with us that at least they aren't going to pursue us for enforcement. Um, there is an opportunity to do that. And, and so just to, 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 you know, close on this particular topic, um, if you're going to have noncompliances, it is best to evaluate 
the EPA policy because in most instances, even if the state has the primary jurisdiction, EPA has oversight because it's a delegated program. So you're going to want to know that both in that instance, the state and EPA policies would appear to protect you or at least that you're preserving the information that you can use later on to say this was a non-compliance that was directly related to um, COVID-19. Um, do everything you can to plan for non-compliances. Look at your contingency plans. Look at your emergency preparation. Look at you know uh, equipment inventories if you're continuing to operate. Um, you know, look at shutdown plans if you think you're going to have to shut down the facility and, and do everything you can to show that you've minimized the level of impact or non-compliance that, that you're going to have. Um, and then as you start to bring facilities back online, the same things are going to be essential. You know, a well thought out plan that we've addressed minimizing the risk when we bring the facility back online of having a non-compliance. If we should have a um, resurgence of COVID-19 uh, um, illnesses and, and claims that come in um, after you restart, that's one of the things you, you know, should be thinking about. Um, and just in closing to mention a couple other non-compliance issues, we have been working with, with uh, clients who during this period have shifted their manufacturing or they've wanted to shift manufacturing to, um, to make ventilators or they wanted to make uh, hand sanitizer or, or to do other things to assist in this effort. Uh, generally, EPA and FDA have been very accommodating with those types of requests. And they're, they're doing things to um, make that possible, but there could be environmental implications for that. So as you start to, to, to think through those things, um, you know, think about, for instance, how it might impact a facility that has an air permit. Um, if you're going to start making a new product, if you're going to start making something that has new emissions, either into your into the air or into your wastewater system, for instance, or you're going to generate a new type of waste, um, you, you're just going to want to think through those things from an environmental perspective before you actually launch into doing what obviously is a, an encouraged and a good thing during this crisis. So with that, um, I think we are at a conclusion. To the presentation and again don't forget that if you if you have questions you can email those to um, Amanda Miller at the uh, email address that was indicated for the conference um, also we will be sending out a copy of the presentation and a recording to attendees and uh, please also feel free to check Nelson Mullins website for the COVID-19 resource list there's a lot of helpful information and links to places where you can get other information about uh, COVID-19 related uh, resources that are included on the Nelson Mullen site. Uh, again, uh, thank you thanks. to the, the other speakers. Thanks, and, uh, Thank you Chris for- Blake. Sorry, this is Chris Blake. I'll just jump in again. and I wanna make sure we thank all of our attendees today. Uh, both Wes, Bernie, and I really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day and we hope that you have found this information helpful. Uh, and we also hope that you all stay safe and stay safe and healthy in these difficult and challenging times. Um, uh, and then finally, I want to thank uh, some of our dedicated IT and marketing professionals who you didn't hear on the presentation, but who did a lot of hard work in the background to make sure that this webinar was able to go forward today as smoothly and seamlessly as it did. And we appreciate their efforts as well. And with that, I think we will sign off and um, thank everyone for attending. Thanks. Thanks.